Good to be in God's house tonight. Good to study His Word and good to be together with one another. We appreciate you folks online joining with us and being with us, being faithful to God's Word and to His service. And and this is this is better than sitting at home listening to the news. Amen. It's a lot better than listening to the news anymore. This is the good news. We have been looking in John chapter 4, studying different things about, uh, so far we've been looking at the woman at the well and the things that have transpired there. Uh, I have uh, up on the screen verses 25 uh, through 30, but let's... Um, Let's just kind of back up a little bit and let's go to, oh, let's see here, verse 9. We won't go all the way back to the beginning, but remember that she's a Samaritan woman. The Jews don't have anything to do with the Samaritans. Uh, they considered them half-breeds and, and things like that. Yes, Jews can be racist too. Imagine that. Uh, Hitler was a racist against the Jews. Jews were racist as well. The story of the Good Samaritan. How that this Jewish man was beaten and left for dead and robbed. And even a priest, Jewish priest, tribal Levi, went around him, didn't want to touch him. But it was a Samaritan man. Somebody that those Jews thought that they were better than them who bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine uh, for healing, going against bacterial and germs, things like that, which they didn't even understand back then, but they knew you pour wine in a wound and that somehow it helps it. And um, even and left him with a man and said, anything that it cost, when I come back this way, you let me know and I'll pay it. And... Um, he said, that's who your neighbor is. It's not the people that you like. It's people that sometimes you don't like or the people that you were told not to like. And I think that's how it is sometimes. John chapter 4, pick it up, verse 9. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest me, drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and what is the gift of God? It's salvation. It's, uh, it's God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the gift of God. He said, if thou knewest the gift of God. And who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink. Thou wouldest have asked of him and he would have given thee living water. You remember that because she's going to. And this woman, this woman is about to bring down a city. She's about to. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. And verse 11. The woman said to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. The well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered, and Jesus knew, he knew the answer, he knew, he knew he was dealing with, he's the word of God. He, he is able to discern what's going on in her soul. Jesus said unto her, go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered, said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou, uh, thou now hast is not thy husband, in that, in that saidst thou truly. And something that I, I don't think I've mentioned in this. Jesus knew this woman was living in a state of sin. Knew she was. Did he, was he going to, was he going to hit her? Was he going to yell at her? Was he going to punish her? Was he going to, no. His first coming 
was about his salvation of sinners. When um, the woman caught in adultery was rolled out there right in front of Jesus and they all had stones in their hands ready to stone her to death. What did Jesus do? Nothing except forgave her sin. He said, go and sin no more. Mary Magdalene, she is, has obviously, this is what I gather from Mary Magdalene. And I personally don't believe that she was the harlot who poured, um, who anointed Jesus' feet. I personally don't believe that. The Bible doesn't say it and I just, that was the deal about the Da Vinci Code was she's the harlot and so on. But the Bible said that she had seven devils. And you don't get that just overnight. You practice the occult. She was deep into occult practices. Had seven devils in her. And Jesus delivered her from those seven devils. And she followed him all the days of her life. We'll get to see her one of these days. Amen. Think about that. The woman that did uh, anoint Jesus' feet. The woman that washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. And, of course, everybody said, Jesus, if you knew what kind of woman this was touching your feet, you wouldn't have her touching your feet. And who did Jesus chew out? Did he chew out the, the harlot woman? Or did he chew out the host of the feast? And he said, since I've been here, you offered me nothing. Here this woman comes in, washes my feet. And he said, everywhere the gospel is preached, this woman is going to be known all over the world. And we're telling her story today. You see, that's what he did. He came to have mercy first. Not judgment. Not wrath. It's not time for God's wrath yet. It's coming. But it's not time for God's wrath. It is time for God's mercy don't forget that. Let's not as a church forget that. It is time for God's mercy. Still is. And uh, yeah, amen. Um, thou hast had five husbands. Verse 19, the woman saith unto her, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. We talked about that last Wednesday night. Uh, and and I, don't, I don't think I really touched... You know, the, the tip of the iceberg of, of worship and what all it means. But I wanted to get the point across that what you serve, you worship. What you serve, you worship. And um, so that was the lesson from, from last week. And now tonight, verse 25, the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh which is called Christ. Does anybody know, uh, just off chance, what those words mean? Messiah and Christ. They both mean the same thing. Messiah is the Hebrew word for it. Christ is the Greek word, or Christos is the Greek word for it. But what do those words actually mean? Does anybody know? The, they mean multimillionaire, do they mean good-looking guy? Huh? Uh, no. Uh, but you're close. His name, Jesus, meant Savior. Okay? Messiah meant the anointed one. The one who has been anointed. Um, turn to Psalm 2. Uh, and I don't know the etymology of, of that particular word, but I know that 
both Christos and Messiah uh, both mean the same thing. Um, I haven't I haven't really dealt with this subject for a while, uh, but the Hebrew roots movement uh, I've dealt with in the past, and they refute they absolutely refuse to say Christ. They will not say it because that's a Greek. They uh, Jim Staley, who's he's finally out of prison, and he's trying to he's trying to con people out of money to kickstart his ministry back. He wants his ministry back. He wants his church back. Um, he's on probation. There are certain things he can and cannot do. But he's he's been on the internet telling everybody he's going to get everything rolling back again. And he's all Hebrew roots. Let's worship on the Sabbath day. Let's call him Yeshua. And he never called, he never said words like the Apostle Paul. It was always Rav Shaul, Rabbi Saul. And he never used the word Christ. He would never use it. He would always say Yeshua HaMashiach or Mashiach or Jesus the Messiah or whatever. But because he felt his, his idea and the Hebrew roots and the sacred name people, their idea was that the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew. Even though there are absolutely no copies of the New Testament in Hebrew anywhere anywhere um, beyond I couldn't give you I couldn't give you a date but there's no way that the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew and that's their claim was that it was written in Hebrew and then the pagan Greco Romans got a hold of it and messed it all up by changing the wording of it into Greek Thus removing the idea that you still had to go and keep as much of the law as you can, which is what they believe. And you have to keep the feast days and you have to be circumcised and you have to do this and you have to do that. That's what they say. And, and but our Bible clearly, to, I mean, it, look at that verse. Uh, where, where were we? Um, verse 25, the woman said unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. What does your Bible tell you? The word Messiah and the word Christ, are they different words? Do they mean different things? They are one and the same. And by the way, it doesn't matter what language you speak either, neither. Amen. Uh, God, God is going to save them all out of every language. But anyway, uh, Psalm chapter 2. Uh, verse 1, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Say, and his anointed would be Christ. Um, and I, I see us in there as well. Simply because of the fact that we are in Christ. Je and Jesus said, if they hate you, it's because they hate me. So when the, marvel not if the world hates you. It's because they hate me. And that's what he's saying here. The kings of the earth, the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, his Messiah, his Christ. The one that God anointed... Um, ordained when uh, Samuel went to find the first king Saul. He took a cruise of oil and he poured it over his head. He anointed him to be the king. When Samuel also went looking for the king who was to take Saul's place, going to the house of Jesse, he takes a cruise of oil with him. When he finally finds David and God says, this is the one right here. He pours that cruise of oil over him and literally anoints him and just pours oil all over him. Oil is a, you could say, would be a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Meaning that he now has, he has the fullness of the Spirit in him. Revelation chapter 5 says that the Lamb, Christ, he has seven eyes, he has seven horns, which are the seven spirits of God. Isaiah says that. Isaiah was at 61 and Jesus reading from Isaiah in Luke chapter 4. The Lord hath anointed me. 
He has given me his blessing. He's poured his oil on me. He's given me of his spirit is what that means. So now back in John chapter 4. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is coming. She believes. And she's looking for the Messiah. And I would ask you tonight, are you looking for Christ to come? I am. Some days worse than others. Amen. I'm looking in the sky. I'm looking under rocks. I'm looking at Christ. Show up. I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us how much? All things. You don't have to worry whether or not every doctrine of God is in your Bible. It's in there. And that's to the people who've told you and who've told me, Mike, not everything that God does is in the Bible. That is a made up doctrine. And it's made up by people who want to believe things that are not biblical. Like studying, the, uh, I saw Tom Horn, he's got a new TV broadcasting deal. And they, uh, if you go to their website, which I won't tell you what it is. But if you go to their website, they have a huge series, book, DVDs, everything for your love offering of 60 bucks or whatever on the book of Enoch. Book of Enoch is not in your Bible. The book of Enoch was never in your Bible. The book of Enoch is not supposed to be in your Bible. The book of Enoch is a big fat lie. I wouldn't trust. I've read most of it, not all of it. I don't trust. The only part I trust is when it says in there, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, because that's what Jude said, Enoch said. But do not fall into the trap of these extra biblical books. Uh, I think I, at one time you used to have a copy of the book of Lamech, which was very interesting. It was a very interesting read. It was a historical background of some of the things that happened in the Bible. It, might, it, might, it was No, not Lamech, Jasher, the book of Jasher. It's very interesting read, but it's not in the scriptures, nor is it intended to be in the scriptures because it is not infallible. You cannot count on it. And when I hear people talk about how the book of Enoch has these amazing messianic prophecies in there, I'm going, the, the Messiah that they are prophesying of cannot be the Messiah that you and I believe in. They must, it's a lie. They must be the Antichrist, not the real Christ. And as there is an Antichrist, a false Christ, there is also a false anointing. A false spirit that falls upon people and they become full of it. You can take that however you want me to mean it. But they are. And they are lying through their teeth, spending... And that just, it drives me nuts how a Christian, so-called Christian ministry can invest the study, have the DVDs made, the books printed, and sell you a study of a book that God never had anything to do with. And I mean the book of Enoch. That just bug, that just gets me. I'm telling you that, see, what that is, remember what Jesus said about this well of water that he's talking about. He said, once you drink of this well, you will never thirst again. So what does that tell you? When they have to, they have to, because they can't find anything else in the Bible, they leave the Bible, go to the book of Enoch, and what they're doing is that they're telling you, well, we didn't find really any, anything else in the Bible worth giving you, so now we're going to go to another book that God had nothing to do with. He did not inspire it. He did not write it. Holy men of God did not speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Enoch did not write that book. 
They sell that to you and they tell you, here's some different water from a different well. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. Uh, they, when you go back and I'm still got, I've still got my hand open here to Psalm 2. They take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. They will speak against the scriptures. They will speak against Christ, the word of God. Back in John chapter 4. She says, when he has come, he will tell us all things. And I'm just telling you, I'm telling you, I love you. But what you need is a Bible. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. I am Christ. I am Messiah. I am. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, what seekest thou for or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot, went away into the city. Now I want you to think now. In the Bible, there's a constant theme. Two cities. One of them is Jerusalem above. The other one would be Babylon the Great. Of which earthly Jerusalem is also a type of Babylon the Great. When Paul was explaining the symbolism of Sarah and Hagar in Galatians 4, he said that Sarah and her seed, Isaac, represents Jerusalem above, which is free, which is the mother of us all. But then he said, Hagar and Ishmael represent uh, Mount Sinai and those who were born of Mount Sinai, those who were under the covenant of Sinai, they are born into bondage. They're not free. They're in bondage. They're slaves because their mother was in bondage. She was a slave Therefore, their children were slaves as well. And all of those who were born under the law are still in bondage. And earthly Jerusalem is a type of that. I have a picture upstairs that I keep up there. Tim Barron sent it to me. He made a trip to Israel. And God bless that guy. He, he doesn't have... God just blesses him. He's not afraid to go up to these Hasidic Jews and give them gospel tracts. He's not afraid. He loves people so much, he just wants them to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's a picture of, of up there of this old Jewish man has got this big hat on, the curls, you know. And these young, look like teenage Jewish boys with their phylacteries on their heads, things like that. And, and all those boys are smiling. And I know they're laughing at Tim. I know Tim. He must be doing something off camera and got their attention. But he gave every one of those guys gospel tracts. And I look at that picture every now and then and I say, I, I wonder if one of these boys isn't one of the 144,000 that came to Christ because a man who just loves people enough to give them the gospel gave them a gospel tract and they read it and they believe that Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies, all the typology. He's the lamb and they asked Jesus into their heart. It's been done before. But this woman went her way into the city and saith, to the men, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? She's going into town and telling every, well, she says to the men. Let's just say that the men in town know her. Right? 
And she's had five husbands. She's living with another one. And let's just say that there's more than five or more than six. But she goes to all the men in town. And she says, the Messiah. I found him. I know where he is. Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Verse 39. Look at what they did. They went out of the city. And came unto him. And tonight, and you know, I spent a little time getting here. But there is a, another theme in the scripture. And it has to do with your salvation. You'll have to come out of the city. You're going to have to leave the camp. You're going to have to walk away from the life that you used to be. Baptism is, shows that. It shows that you are, have died to the old life, the old guy, the old lifestyle, the old places you ran to, the old things that you did. The old words you used to say, all that you, you left everything. When God first spoke to Abram, all the way back in Genesis 12, what did he say? Abram, you're fixing to move. Get thee up out of this land and go to this land here. He called him out. Of where he was born to give him a better place. And then they went out of the city. Jesus, listen, Jesus is not going to Babylon. And one of the mistakes that I was going to make with this church when Right after Matthew was born, or about the same time, I know it was after Matthew was born, was turn this church into Babylon to appeal to Babylon to bring Babylonians in because that's what everybody else was doing. And I wanted in on that. I wanted in on that church growth. I wanted in on that recognition. I wanted in on that. Let's... Let's dumb it down. Let's change everything. I wanted in on that. And God whooped me so hard over that. You will never believe how hard God beat me over that. But he said, you're not going to do that, Mike. I won't let you. And if I don't get some cooperation out of you... I'll take you out of here and I'll bring somebody in that will cooperate. And I started bawling my eyes out. I said, God, please don't do that. They came out of the city. Jeremiah 50. Remove out of the midst of Babylon and go forth out of the land of the Chaldeans and be as the he goats before the flocks. A constant theme throughout the Bible is that no matter what it is, when you are truly saved, God brings you out of it. Now, maybe not all at once. Maybe not all in the same day. Maybe not instantaneously, the moment you get up from wherever you got saved at. Maybe not all at once, but he will start re removing you out of Babylon. Leave. Start grabbing your stuff and let's, let's get out. Let's go. Jeremiah 51 verse 6. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Now you look at this. Every man his soul. That could be seen as a double witness to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
Because did God automatically save Lot's wife simply because she was Lot's wife? No. Did God save uh, Lot's two sons-in-laws simply because they were betrothed to Lot's daughters? No. They weren't going to leave. They stayed. Lot's wife got up, followed behind them, turned around, looked back, wanted to go back there. God turned her into a pillar of salt. You can't go back. There's nothing. And what God will do is that He will show you there's nothing there. One of the first things I did when I got on Facebook. I didn't get on Facebook when everybody else got on Facebook. I didn't want anything to do with it. But when they started, when I found out we could, you know, kind of promote the videos and things we were doing. So I got on Facebook. And I started looking up all these guys I went to Bible college with and high school with. Because Jim, I thought, we'll get the old gang back together. Get the old guys back together. It'll be just like it used to be when we was in high school. Be just like it was when we was in Bible college. You know what I found out? There ain't a one, well, there's one. There is one man. One man. From my days in Bible college. That will still have something to do with me. It's Craig Shaw. When we leave to go to start our little trip to Vegas, we're going to stop at his house just outside of Tulsa. I haven't seen him in probably 20, 20, 20 years, somewhere around in there. I haven't seen him since then. But he's the only one. One of them, one of them, I was, we have pretty good buds. And I befriended him on Facebook. He befriended me back. And I started looking at his posts. And then it dawned on me. He's sodomite. He's a sodomite. And he made some kind of comment. And I wrote him in the comments. I said, you weren't like this when you were in Bible college, were you? He said, oh, yes, I was. What I wanted to ask I was, was, who was all with you? Because I guarantee you, he wasn't alone there. But nobody from my past really wants anything to do with me. The buddy that I hung around in junior high school, middle school, high school, we did everything together. Nothing. In fact... In fact, we met up, our first year in college together, we met up, or I called him, and talked to him a little bit, how's everything going? We have a conversation for about 10 minutes, Jim, he pops, pops this one on me. He said, I'm taking a philosophy course. And he said, uh, I'm reasonably sure that I just don't believe in God anymore. What a shame. What a shame. When God calls you out, God may let you do what he did with me. God may let you go and try to look up all these people. Let's get the gang back together. There is no gang anymore. They don't want anything to do with you. And I guarantee you, you spent five minutes with them. You wouldn't want anything to do with them either. Especially not the guy that I found out was a sodomite. Because I'm going, uh-uh. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. It's your responsibility. 
Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance, and he will render unto her a recompense. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have been drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. And there are two types of people in this world, saved and lost, sober and drunk. Drunk on fornication, drunk on social media, drunk on false doctrines. Drunk with different spirits from different religions. They are mad, the Bible says. And mad doesn't mean angry. It means they are flipped out of their mind. And they can't think straight. They can't see straight. They can't hear straight. They can't walk straight. And they probably never will. And God says, if they stay in Babylon, I'm, I'm going to destroy them. I'm not going to say Babylon. Um, turn, to, um, turn to Ezekiel 14. I know I've probably touched on this recently, probably in a pastor mic online, I've been studying different things, but Ezekiel 14, if, if you think this, and listen young people, if you think that just because your mom and daddy's in church, or your daddy's the pastor, or your mama does this, or whatever, you think, if you think that counts for you, you're wrong. God said in verse 20 of Ezekiel 14, Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, but they shall deliver, uh, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness, period. If it's just three people, that's all it is. And not even their families will I save. I won't save their sons and their daughters just because they're Noah's sons or Daniel's sons or, or, or Job's sons. I'm not going to save, I'm not going to save any of them. If they don't believe in me and trust in me, I'm not going to save them simply because they're Job's kids. And that's, you would be surprised at the number of church people who believe that way. Well, my father is this, or my mother is this, and we go to this church. We've been to this church all of our lives, and we've been, had our membership down there for years, and I know I'm going to heaven because I've had my, because, and they believe that! But they living in Babylon, and when if they and if they're still there, God when God destroys Babylon, He will destroy them. Second Corinthians six, turn there. Second Corinthians six. Verse sixteen. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And if you go back with it, if you, if you make notes in your Bible, when you get to that point there where it says, for what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of God. Write Ezekiel 14 there and then go back and study that because the very beginning of Ezekiel 14 is where God says, they come and inquire of me and ask me, God, will you speak to us? And God says, they have an abundance of idols in their heart. I can see them. They're hiding them from everybody else, but I know they're there. I'm not going to speak to them, but according to the stumbling block of their iniquity that's in their heart. In other words, I will, I will allow them to believe lies, big ones, because they have idols in their heart that they bow to secretly and God says I will let them be lied to every time so that's what that is the temple what agreement at the temple of God with idols for you're the temple of the living God and you go back and read Ezekiel 14 and compare those things together you'll see it you'll see there's a match there God says you got idols in your heart I'm gonna let you're gonna believe every lie there is as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And you know what happens when God is your father? He will never stop having mercy on you. Now, he may beat you 
silly over your sins, but he will never stop having mercy on you. And I mean beat you and then beat you again. And you think, oh, I'm not going to live through this. God says, yes, you are. Calm down. But I've got to drive this out of you. Oh, I'm going to drive it out of you, God says. But you've got to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Hebrews 13. Look at this. Hebrews 13, 11. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. So they brought... Here's what they would do at the sacrifice. They'd take the blood of the sacrifice and they would take that into the most holy place and they would sprinkle that upon the, the Ark of the Covenant. But what about the body of the sacrifice itself? That had to go outside the camp to be burned without the camp. Where was Jesus crucified? They led him outside of the city of Jerusalem. In a place, I believe, a place called Gordon's Calvary. It, it looks, it does look like a skull. Where the Catholic Church says it is, I don't believe it is. They, I think they get it wrong every time. They, they think they picked Mount Sinai. I don't think they, they, I know for a fact they didn't pick Mount Sinai because they picked one in Egypt. And Mount Sinai is not in Egypt. Paul said it's in Arabia. Anyway, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate, outside the city gate. Let us go therefore, th let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, meaning outside of the camp. I had to leave the camp. I had to, when, when God first began to deal with me and put me back straight as a pastor, as a minister, as a preacher, I thought all my pastor elders that I looked up to would be very happy that I was Back on the straight and narrow. And the moment I said the word King James. You would not believe the animosity. That was driven my way. The state. Missouri State Secretary of Free Will Baptist. Chewed me out on the phone. Over the issue of the King James Bible. And I. Loved that man. We were going to the Missouri camp. Remember those days, Sparky? And what was her name? Her mom and dad used to run the bookstore down there. You know, she went to school here. Tr Tracy Wilfong. They'd... Had, they had, they'd open up a little bookstore for kids to have little Christian books and things like that, little trinkets and things they, they could buy. And I gave my videotapes to them and I said, just take them for free. If anybody buys them, just keep the money. When one of the board members found out that my videotapes were there, he took them physically down and he said, these are never to be put back up here again. I don't want to see this ever again. And those people were my friends. And after all that, and a bunch of other things started happening. And I said, I'm done. I'm done. I'm leaving. I'm not going to be part of a people who obviously don't want me around. I won't be a part of it. And we left the camp. And not going back. Let us go, therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach for here we have no continuing city but we seek one to come if we lose America we've got a better place to go amen Ruth 2.11 this, and I'll finish with this Ruth was a Moabitess 
She was from Moab. Her and Orpah. Oprah Winfrey's mother misspelled Orpah. When she gave, she named, she meant to name her Orpah and misspelled it as Oprah. That little piece of knowledge that you'll take to you with, to, you, to your grave, you'll remember that I said this to it. Orpah stayed. Ruth said, Whithersoever thou goest, I will go. So now that Ruth has, has stayed, Boaz, she's going to, her and Boaz are falling in love with each other. They're going, they're fixing to get hitched. Boaz answered and said unto her, it has been fully showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband. In other words, I heard about how you stuck with her. And he says, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity. Nativity means you, where you were a native. The, the land of your birth. The land of my birth was Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Roy... I was that far from being born a Cajun. Whew, thank God. But the land of your nativity is where you used to be from. But remember, you're not there anymore. And if you were to go back, you wouldn't know the place. And if you would try to get back in with the old gang, they don't want you. And you would find out quickly, you don't want them. It's a lesson here, people. Young people have to learn it. Young people have to learn this lesson. They have to, they have to find out that what I'm saying tonight is true. But he said, you left the land of your nativity and art come unto a people which thou knewest not here, heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. I am convinced that Ruth represents the Gentile believers in Christ. Who are married to Christ to save um, Naomi who is the people of Israel. To save them. To restore back to them the breach that God has made in his covenant with them. I believe God is going to use the Gentiles to do that. And in order to do that, we have to understand this world is not our home anymore. And I love America. I talked about it yesterday. I love this country. And I would love for God to turn it back around. God, but God would have to do it. But if he doesn't, I have a better country to go to. I'm not going to lose. No matter what happens, I am not going to lose. I will gladly leave the land of my nativity for a new land. I will gladly do that. Our pilgrim forefathers did exactly that. They left England. They left Holland. They left wherever they were in Europe. And because of the Church of Rome and the Church of England... And all them stuffed shirts wouldn't let them worship and believe the Bible the way they wanted to. They just said, fine, we'll leave. And they came over here. Most of them died. But they said, we'd rather come over here and die than stay here and be in bondage. They left their home and came over here and started this land. That Bible's right. Amen.